Okay, the next group of people we're going to talk about are the Hiberno-Saxons. So um, I talked last time about monasteries in England, Scotland, and Ireland. Specifically, we're going to look at the ones in Ireland now because that's where the Hiberno-Saxons live. Hibernia was the Roman name for Ireland, so that's who we're talking about. Um, at the same time that we have Christian um, missionaries kind of existing in Europe, who would meaning they're like going out and trying to convert people and stuff like this, we also have uh, monasteries in Northern Europe um, who are staying in the same place and are uh, fairly stable, except that they keep getting sacked by Vikings all the time. But um, they are able to sponsor art within a Christian context, okay? So we, we start seeing more development in artworks at this time, a little bit in architecture, but specifically uh, largely in illuminated manuscripts is mostly what we're going to look at. So in Ireland, the people who existed there before the Hiberno-Saxons are the Celts, so, and it's pronounced Celts, not Celts. I know that in America we have a sports team called the Celtics. No, Celtic, Celts, okay, C-E-L-T-S. So we have the Celts there, they convert, they largely convert to Christianity, um, and then uh, that becomes the primary patron group for the arts in Ireland at this time. Um, monks tend to isolate themselves away from worldly temptations in cities. So a lot of the monasteries are on the coast and are sort of further away from other cities. Um, the most famous Irish monk, uh, St. Columba, sets up a monastery on, on Iona. Okay, so this is an island off the coast of Ireland called Iona. Um, this becomes a major artistic center. Illuminated Christian books of monks' libraries um, are one of our major sources of artwork in this time period. Uh, monks were the ones doing the um, scribe work, the transcription, the copying of holy books for Christianity. They're also the ones illustrating them. So we uh, at monasteries have spaces called scriptoria, and the scriptoria are where the monks would uh, copy down, write the, the books, and also illustrate them. Um, some of the monks specialized in writing, and some in illustrating, and some in gilding, and some did like all of the things. This is an example from Iona. This is the Book of Duro. Uh, so the Book of Duro contains the Gospels, and the Gospels of the Christian Bible, it's the New Testament part of the Bible, um, are Matthew, Mark, John, and Luke. And they all have specific um, iconography. They have specific representa visual representation. So Matthew, the book of Matthew, he's represented by a man, a human. Sometimes that human has wings, sometimes not. The symbology behind this is that the human is supposed to represent the human ancestry of Christ. So we talked in the Byzantine lectures about the humanity of Christ and how that was something that was a big topic of interest in early Christendom. The book of Mark. Mark is represented as a lion. That's supposed to be um, a representation of the voice of God calling in the wilderness, sounding like a lion roar. Uh, John is represented as an eagle. That's because of the soaring style of his writing. Uh, that seems like a little bit of a reach to me, but okay, John's an eagle. And then Luke is represented as an ox. And that is because of um, there's a description, a detailed description in that book of a priest sacrificing an ox. So basically each of the Gospels tells the story of Christ's life and death um, slightly differently, from slightly different perspectives, and their symbols, their icons that represent them, derive from how they're different from each other. So Matthew is a man, Mark, lion, John, eagle, Luke, ox. So when we look at the book of Duro and we see this, we know that this is the beginning of the gospel of Matthew because he is represented by a man. Couple of things to notice about this. 
very abstract, very flat, not realistic looking at all, right? Um, so we've come a long way from the classical uh, Greek and Roman depictions of humans, right? So this is a very different kind of look. You'll also notice that we have all this interlace patterning around the border. Um, so a lot of influence there uh, from this interlace patterning that, that's popular at the time. This is what's called a carpet page. A carpet page is just kind of like a um, section break. It often be between different parts of a book, different books of the Bible. And it's just an entirely illustrated decorative page that doesn't have necessarily any other meaning and it doesn't have any text. Um, from the book of Duro, here are the other gospels. So we have our lion, which is Mark. We have the eagle for John and we have the ox for Luke. So all very abstract, a little off center, not like the, not my, my favorite, the, the book of Duro is not my favorite <laughs> in terms of stylistically as represented, but you can see that all of them have a similar palette. They all have this interlace patterning around the outside, and they're all pretty abstract and uh, kind of flat in the way they're depicted. Okay. Um, so, St. Jerome is uh, an important figure because he produces the Vulgate Bible in 420. This is written in Latin or the common tongue. So a lot of people are illiterate at this time, but more people could understand Latin than could understand um, other languages. So uh, it's, it's called the Vulgate because it was considered vulgar to have a holy book written in the common tongue, but um, it reached more people, more people could understand it. Really quick, I just want to go through the kinds of books that we have at this time. Most of them are religious books. There are very few secular books being produced in this time period in Europe. Um, so if you have the Old and New Testament together, that's the Bible. It's generally written in Greek until St. Jerome's, where we have things written in Latin. Um, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. Those are the same books that are in the Torah in the Jewish community. Lectionaries are books used for sermons in church with a variety of popular biblical passages. It's kind of like a cliff notes. I don't know if cliff notes is even a thing. It's just like a selection of key passages from all different parts of the Bible. So if you're a priest and you're trying to find things for your sermon, books are very expensive. There aren't many books that have the entirety of the Bible available. So a lectionary just has like kind of the highlights that tend to be useful for sermons. Um, breviaries are texts required for monks' daily uh, recita uh, recitations, the things they recite every day as part of their um, religious practice. Um, sacramentaries are prayers that priests use in mass, so it's prayers that they have to have available to them to use in service. Benedictionals are blessings that are specifically used by bishops. The Book of Hours um, is prayers and passages for churchgoers to use at home for different times of the day. So if you have a book of hours, you are literate, you're probably um, pretty wealthy to be able to have something like that. Um, passionals are compilations of hagiographies. A hagiography is a biography of a saint. So a passional is just a group of stories of the lives of saints. Um, and then we have some secular books that are also produced by monks that relate to science history. Some of the classics from um, Greco-Roman times uh, literature, but they're not um, as illustrated. So the, the secular books don't tend to have as, as much illumination as the religious books. Why do we have all these different kinds of books? Well, because there's 46 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament of the Christian Bible. So that's um, a lot of writing to do by hand. So these separate volumes are created for different specific purposes. Because again, the printing press isn't invented until the 15th century when Gutenberg invents it. So everything has to be written in hand, which is literally where we get the word manuscripts. Manu, 
means hand, scriptus means writing. So written by hand is literally what manuscripts means uh, in Latin. Okay, so let's look at another group of uh, monks and what they were doing. This is Lindisfarne Island. So uh, there's a monastery there and from the gospels produced at Lindisfarne, we have some really beautiful illuminated uh, manuscripts. So this is a carpet page. We saw this earlier in the Book of Duro. Um, and again, this is kind of like a space break between like different uh, biblical sections, different books in the, in the Bible or whatever the publication is. Um, anyone have a Celtic knot tattoo? I feel like they were really popular when I was younger in the 90s and maybe they're not <laughs> as popular anymore. I have one on the back of my neck. Uh, Basically, um, when you think about those kind of tattoos, look at this line work. So this is where they come from. Look at the, I've kind of got a, a zoomed in picture here. So look at all that intricate little detail in line work. Imagine doing all of that by hand at that tiny of a level. It's kind of crazy. So let's look at some other examples. These are also from the Lindisfarne Gospel from different um, carpet pages. You can see here that we have just the abstract interlace pattern, but there's also the zoomorphic. Uh, zoomorphic being the um, interlace pattern that has animals built in with it. So you can see these are kind of animal heads, uh, bird heads wrapped in here. Okay. Another vocabulary word for you, a colophon. So the colophon is an inscription that's usually on the last page of a manuscript. And it often says either who wrote the book, who illustrated the book, who the patron of the book was, like who it's dedicated to, who ordered it, uh, and sometimes where it's made. So um, this one, the colophon inscription here, says, Eid Firth, Bishop of Lindisfarne, wrote these Gospels for God and Saint Cuthbert. Cuthbert. Saint Cuthbert's relics were preserved at Lindisfarne, um, and he's the patron saint of Northumbria, which is the region where this um, monastery was. So relics related to saints are items that, um, we'll talk about this more when we get to the Romanesque, but basically, uh, relics are either part of a saint's body, so like their bones or something, or something they owned or wore or touched. So you can see the, the beautiful uh, linear work on here and then just kind of, it's like signing your work basically, saying like I made these and I made them to honor God and the saint. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right, let's look at arguably the most famous of all illuminated manuscripts. This is the Book of Kells, which you've maybe maybe heard of. Um, whether you've heard of it or not, you need to know about it because it's definitely on your test. Um, it's named after an abbey that once owned it. It was the chief relic of the Western world at the time. It was kept in a very elaborate metalwork box, a reliquary, a specially bejeweled metal uh, fancy box to hold precious things in. Um, so let's just look at some pages. So this is uh, Christ enthroned and you can see these elaborate birds on either side. You can also see representations of saints on either side, uh, of e angels rather. And then this is probably the most famous page from the Book of Kells. It's something that you're going to need to be able to identify. This is the Cairo page. So remember when we were talking about uh, the Byzantine and the pre-Byzantine early um, Christian symbology and iconography, the chi and the rho, the chi looks like an X, the rho looks like a P. Those are the first two letters of Christ in uh, Greek. So here we have the chi, the rho, and the iota. Um, so this is starting off, uh, it's the opening page of the book of Matthew actually. So in the iota, it uh, has the head of a man at the end of it. It's kind of, it's right here, kind of in the center. So that's how we know it's the beginning of the book of Matthew and the first word in the beginning of the book of Matthew is Christ. Um, so let's, 
take another look at this. You can see all the different interlacing and we have zoomorphic interlace where we have different animal heads. Really intricate work there. You can see Matthew's head again. Okay, so be able to identify the Cairo page from the Book of Kells. Important thing to know. Um, the I think this is the last thing that we're looking at in this section are high crosses. So most of the work from this time period that's significant artistically is in the illuminated manuscripts, but we also have sculptural work. So up until this point, we've seen mostly small portable things, um, but there is a return of large scale sculpture um, at the monasteries, and these are called high crosses. Um, some of them are more than 20 feet tall, they can be quite large. They're um, in burial grounds of monasteries. They are freestanding sculptures, and they often are a cross that has a circle around the, the crossing point, and the ends of the cross are kind of squared off. They have usually a lot of adornment in relief sculpture. Uh, sometimes in the relief, it depicts scenes, usually from the crucifixion or the last judgment. And then you can also see a lot of interlace patterning on these as well. So that's just to say that um, large-scale sculpture does come back in this time period, particularly among the Hiberno-Saxons. Okay, next we'll talk about the Visigoth and Mozambique art.